Thank you. So imagine a little fat math nerd in 1962, 50 years ago. I had just entered the ninth grade. I was ready to do my math, and it was going to be an exciting year. I had no idea that within that period, in a few months, I'd be in church on a Wednesday night, not wanting to be there. What kid wants to be in church on a Wednesday night? And my parents would placate me by allowing me to use my math and do my math while I listened to the person. So I'm in the back of the room doing my math, and this man says, if we can get children to march in this demonstration, America will see that even its children know the difference between right and wrong. And he said, and as a result, our children will get a chance to go to the schools where they have more resources. They won't have to have hand-me-down books. And I looked up and I said, who is that guy? And of course, it was Dr. King. And so we got home that night and I said, I've got to go. I've got to go. And the first thing my parents said was, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I said, what do you mean? You're being hypocrites. They said, go to your room, right? Because you didn't talk back to your parents. <laughs> go to your room. They did not say a word to me that night. The next morning, they came in, and all of a sudden, I could tell they had been crying and praying, and they said, if you want to go, we put you in God's hands because you're doing the right thing. It wasn't that we didn't trust you. We just didn't trust the people who'd be responsible for you. Well, here's what happened. All of a sudden, I thought about the dogs and the fire hoses, and, and I, I got scared. I was really scared. But at that point, I kept thinking, wow, I could go to those other schools. And so it wasn't that I was so courageous. Rather, it was that I saw the possibility for the first time that my life didn't have to be at a second-rate level because the world had said to me in the 50s and 60s, I don't care how smart you are in your community, you aren't as good as that. You can't go into to a place to get bathroom, you can't get water, you can't go to the school. And I wanted to see what was possible. And so I ended up leading a group of children to march and then to jail. It was... It was as scary as anything I ever had to do. And when the police chief, Bull Connor, looked down at me and said, what do you want, little nigger? I was so scared. And I looked up and I said, we want to kneel and pray. And he spat in my face and just spat and picked me up and threw me into the police wagon. And I'll never forget spending that week there. And I kept thinking, what does all of this mean? Well, in the middle of the week, Dr. King comes with our parents outside and he said this, what you do this day will have an impact on generations yet unborn. We didn't understand the profundity at that moment, but I knew it was a powerful statement. 50 years later, I could never have imagined when I was in that jail, could never have imagined being president of UMBC, a place with students from 150 countries. What is amazing about my institution is we are working to prepare kids of all races to excel in school at a time when we need more educated Americans than ever before. I always ask audiences the question, how many of you like to read? People raise their hands. I ask them, how many of you love math? People laugh at me all the time, all the time. Somebody will always say, how can you put love and math in the same sentence even, right? And if I asked you the question, how many of you in this audience right now knew by the time you were in the 11th grade that you were either a math science type or a history English type? Raise your hands. If you knew by the time you were in the 11th grade, right? You're thinking, yeah, I did know. If I asked you, how did you know? you probably say I was better at the other area. The challenge we face in America is that we tell children at a very early age you can do math right now, but it's really not for you. You have sent messages without even realizing it that only a few people are supposed to do math and science. Why am I concerned about this? Well, first of all, I'm concerned about getting more young people of all races who will be educated across disciplines. We know we need the humanities and social sciences and the arts. They teach us what it means to be human. They give us our values. They help us to put history in perspective. But we need to understand as a country that we must have a culture of hope. What did that marching do for me? It told me we could have the hope and the optimism to believe the world could be better than it had been that day. So many people in our society, in this country and beyond, are at the point of thinking there is no hope. What gives me hope about this conference is that you're here because you want to figure out what can I do to make a difference. So why is this STEM stuff so important? You hear about STEM all the time. If you talk about healthcare, if you talk about solving diseases and curing diseases, if you talk about the environment, if you talk about energy, if you talk about intelligence, global terrorism, all these areas, areas require strong math and science and engineering, in addition to understanding what it means to be human. And the problem we face is that only 6% of America's 24-year-olds have degrees in natural sciences and engineering. In Europe, it's about double that. In some other countries, it's many more than that. 
And the question is, what can we do about it? Well, you know one answer is, we've got to get more involved in K through 12. We have to give teachers the support that they need. We have to tell mothers to stop, American mothers, to stop telling their daughters that they were not good in math. Give me a hand for mothers telling their daughters. Give me a hand for that. It's very important. It's very important. Very important. We have to have fathers and mothers telling girls and boys, you can do anything you decide to do if you work hard. Give me a hand for that too. It's very important. Very important. And here's, here is the real challenge. Even when you talk about the fact that most of you raised your hand, and I know you were saying, well, no, I'm not a math science type, I'm history English, and you went to college knowing you were not gonna major in that. Believe it or not, even the young people who come to college to major in math and science usually don't make it. I just chaired this big committee, and we started off looking at underrepresentation. Why? Well. NSF, the National Science Foundation, says there's a gap of about 50,000 jobs a year where we don't have the people to fill the jobs. And large numbers of those people are women because the, the percentage of women of all races in computer science as a major is under 20%. 20 under 20% of all the computer science majors are women. Women go into classes and they see one or two people. If we are going to have many more women in computer science, we have to find ways to focus on girls and technology and games that tell girls they can do anything. Again, give me a hand for that, for girls doing anything. It's very important. And it's about changing the culture. The culture of a society, the culture of a school, of a university has to do with the questions that you ask and the ones you don't ask. It has to do with the values that you hold. It's how you believe. Who are you? What's most important to you? What I'm saying is that we as a nation have to decide that we have the wherewithal, the optimism, and the brain power to help our children know all of these positions, these jobs are possible. And the key will be to look at not only K through 12, but at the university. I'm at a university that has really thought about how do we change the culture. How many of you in this room knew somebody who started college with an interest in pre-med or engineering and they changed their majors within the first year or two. It's an American phenomenon. It happens all the time. Half of you in this room, I know, I know, you started out that way. You can laugh, it's okay, it's okay. And the key is this, believe it or not, it doesn't surprise people that only 20% of blacks and Hispanics who begin with a major in science or engineering will graduate with a bachelor's in science and engineering. What is shocking to people is that only 32% of whites who begin with a major in science and engineering will graduate with a major in science and engineering, and only 40% of Asian Americans. So when you put it all together, two thirds of all of the young people who come to college excited about science and engineering leave it within the first year or two. Now, people will say, well, two things. Number one, it's probably because they don't have a good background. Well, listen to this, the higher the SATs, the larger the number of AP credits in STEM areas, the more selective the university, the greater the chance the person will leave science within the first year. Now, what usually happens is the person comes back home, they've been valedictorian at their school, they go off to a big time place, and all of a sudden they come back and people say, what happened? And they say, well, I just like something else better. Well, if you get an A in another course and a C in chemistry, obviously you like it better because you got an A. And that's exactly what happens. Most students get poor grades in those first classes. Why is that? Because we need to change the culture of science, teaching, and learning. And I'm saying to my colleagues, now that I'm old, now that I'm over 60 years old, get over it. We've got to teach children how to do the work in math and science. We must change the culture of science and teaching. And that's what's exciting about UMBC, because faculty decided, let us look at how we might rethink the approach. Number one, we teach kids in high school, if you're smart, you don't need anybody. So what we work to do is to if you go to our website, you'll see a chemistry discovery center. What we do is we don't give people the theories. We have them to work in groups using technology to collaborate, to work to solve problems and figure out all these theories based on real life hands-on problems from the biotech companies on my campus. We have 85 companies, biotech and IT on campus, a lot of cybersecurity companies. So we're taking problems from real life, bringing them into the classroom, having them working in groups. How many of you know that children, K through 12 and college students are bored in class? Raise your hands. How many, they're bored, all right? So the challenge we face with status quo, with all these wonderful faculty and all of us is to think through how to use technology more effectively, how to teach people to work in groups, how to teach them how to collaborate with each other, how to teach them to ask the right questions. You know, I.I. Robbie said that, a Nobel laureate said that when he was growing up in New York, all of his friends' parents would ask them at the end of the day, what did you learn in school today? 
He said, but not my Jewish mother. My Jewish mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And he said, the practice of encouraging his curiosity made him the thinker he became. And that's the point, that we want to teach young people not just to sit there and take notes and let things pull into their heads, pour into their heads, but rather to push them to think and to ask questions and to learn to work effectively with each other. It has worked so well for us in chemistry, we've moved over to physics and biology and mathematics, and now in the humanities and social sciences, we're doing innovation and rethinking the approach in such a way that students are empowered to take charge of their education. Do I think it's gonna mean all online? No, not for a lot of students. Hands-on, working with people, connecting, all very important, but blended instruction, yes. We don't have to lecture on everything in the book. We need to see how much students can do by themselves and then let them struggle with it and let them learn how to work together and then most important, what they don't understand, explicate through lecture. And what that has done for us is to make us a major force in producing students in general. The other area where we've gotten really good attention, few minority kids excel in science and engineering. And yet, if you look at health disparities, you know that if, you're if you are Hispanic, if you're black, and you're a woman over 55, great chance you're going to get diabetes. We need people looking at how to cure these diseases and how to look at specific issues involving particular populations. But that means they have to do so well at the undergrad level, they can go to grad school. I, had, I went around the country trying to find one place that could show me just five to 10 black and Hispanic kids a year who were doing so well that they'd go on and begin, become MD, PhDs, could not find one place in the country. 20 years ago, Bob Meyerhoff said, what can I do to help? We started working on it, faculty worked with us, and we focused on building community among young people, getting researchers to take ownership of these students, pulling them into the labs, rethinking the course approach, and then giving them this notion that they could be fearless, that they could become the leaders in science, regardless of race, men and women, and that they one day might get the Nobel Prize in, in medicine. Just think about it, just to have that vision that that's a possibility. What did it do? I want you to know we've become the leading institution in the country, regardless of race, for sending African Americans on to get MD, PhDs. Give me a big hand for that. Big hand for that. Big hand for that. Big hand for that. You know, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who can suck every ounce of energy out of your body because they're so negative. You know who they are. You know exactly who they are. They're some of your friends sometimes, right? <laughs> then there are other people who can elevate you because they have passion and they, they lift you up and they tell you it's possible because I don't care how hard the problem, if you've got the right attitude, if you have this sense of optimism and hope, and if you can see another way, you just get out there and you try it. And amazingly, those people elevate people all the time. You are here today because you want to be those people who elevate, who say it is possible for children of all races, boys and girls, to succeed in the arts, to succeed in science, and for America to do all it can to help the world through brain power and compassion. You know, Aristotle once said, excellence is never an accident. I love that statement. Excellence is never an accident. It is the result of high intention. It is the result of sincere effort. It is the result of intelligent execution. It represents choosing the wisest among many alternatives. And then finally, choice, not chance, determines your destiny. Choice, not chance, determines your destiny. What will you choose? Dreams and values. Thank you all very much. Thank you.